All right, thank you very much for the introduction. So, um, my name is Jeroen Willemse, and thank you very much for having me here to talk about our project, the Mobile Security Testing Guide. And I'm going to talk a lot. So, I first want to know a little bit about you guys. Can I see some hands, please? Who of you guys is doing pen testing? Who of you guys are doing development? Who of you guys are actually into mobile in general? A few, okay. And how, how many of you guys, by the way, who just lost, raised their hand, know about the mobile security testing guide already? Okay, so if I bore you, I'm very sorry. Feel free to uh, have fun. Um, but then again, you can also use this time to ask me any, any type of questions. Just raise your hand and uh, we'll throw a cone at you um, to speak into it. <laughs> All right, so a little bit about me. I'm Jeroen Willemse. I'm the uh, one of the two project leaders of the Mobile Security Testing Guide. The other project leader is uh, Sven Sleyer. Uh, I'm a security architect. I used to do full stack development and always had a knack for mobile security. Um, so basically, I'm more or less a jack of all trade. You can find my Twitter over there, but the more important Twitter is the MSDG Twitter account. Um, if you want to know more about our project, please follow that one. So where do we want to talk about today? So I want to talk about um, a few different things. The first one is the mobile application security verification standard, which is basically the core of the product um, and lesser known. Then about a mobile security testing guide and ov obviously some nice hacking examples. So question, um, can you do a cross-site request forgery or a cross-site scripting attack on a fully native app without a web view? Anyone there to answer? I, okay, who thinks yes? Can I see some hands? Who thinks no? All right, so if you do a cross-site scripting attack with JavaScript in something that doesn't have an engine to interpret a JavaScript, would you be able to exploit that script? Probably not. Um, so the answer is actually cross-site scripting in a really fully native app. No, you can't really do that. Um, Basically, you could try to load some strings in something, but that doesn't do anything. Cross-site re request forgery, a little bit different. With deep linking, you should be able to get something in there, especially in Android, but um, it's not the same. It's not the same as how we used to have it in web. So mobile security is a bit different uh, because cross-site request forgery, cross-site scripting doesn't really apply, but both reversals do. So, for instance, they found a path reversal um, vulnerability in the Microsoft Office application, so you could start uh, checking all the files in there and get data out of it. Um, and then there's something else that is something that you see much more on mobile, which is data leakage. So, on the web, we kind of were used to, up to later generations of web technologies, to store all the data in the server. And a mobile device, everybody thought, ah, it's safe, doesn't matter, who's going to watch it anyway? So let's have some storage in there. Or we thought, well, nobody's going to attach a debugger there, so if we have the logging, why bother? Um, all of a sudden, we start leaking data through there. And of course, with IPC, uh, either intents or other type of mechanisms, we started to leak data as well. Hmm, that's not a very good idea. So that's a bit different. Um, and what about weak local authentication mechanisms, uh, which we'll discuss a little bit later, or at least the fingerprint, for instance, on iOS. So there are some things in there that are quite different on mobile than on the normal API security stuff and web security stuff. Still, we're talking about the same, con uh, same concept. It's only implemented differently. That's what makes it different in terms of how you test it, and it's different uh, in terms of how you use it. Um, and then, of course, reverse engineering. Because normally, if you wanted to reverse engineer something, you um, either would query the API continuously, try to understand how something works, you dump a chip or whatever, or you just download your website's um, front-facing uh, JavaScript stuff. But here it's a bit different, because you have a binary running somewhere in a container you con the container you're kind of controlling. Um, so to now see what's happening, actually, you have to start dumping that stuff. That's quite different, actually. Um, so how do we fix this? So the way we wanted to fix this is by offering um, uh, a new view at mobile security in general. And we do it with three different pieces. The first piece is the mobile application security verification standard, which I'll dive into in a little bit later. But it basically holds the basic security requirements that we need to actually understand what do you have to secure when you're working with a mobile app. The mobile security testing guide basically shows 
best practices and how you should have implemented those controls or and as well how to uh, detect whether it has been done right and which pitfalls you can normally find. And then of course within the mobile security testing guide there's a mobile AppSec checklist and because I'm not sure are there any compliance people here, CISO people? Just a few. Um, this is especially for you. Uh, Basically, if you want to quickly show that you're complying, that you did the right thing, that the right requirements have been fulfilled, you can easily find that out, then this checklist can help you to quickly check the box. After all, we still have to provide evidence as a security team or as a development team that we did take the requirements into consideration. Uh, and Excel never dies, unfortunately. Uh, well, Excel is a good product, don't get me wrong, but death by Excel in compliance your world is not a good idea, perhaps. But still, since that we don't want to cost out the old traditional work world, we basically introduced this. So let's start with the diving a little bit about a mobile application security verification standard, or MASVS. It started as a fork from the OWASP ASVS, because the ASVS used to have some mobile parts in there, but they were heavily outdated. Um, well, like I said, we formalized best practices and other security requirements. It's mobile specific, it's high level, and OS agnostic. So most of the things you could basically port to, um, uh, or basically uh, any requirements you could translate into something, how you could implement this in iOS or in Android, for instance, or in any other mobile operating system that is still out there. Um, and the reason we did this again is just to make sure you know what to do before you start driving your security program or before you start developing your software, you at least have a clear idea of what you're supposed to do. Um, it's right now a bit different than the ASVS because we cut out a few levels. So we have level one is in standard security, which is something like you could call mobile security hygiene. It basically are the basic controls that you should always implement no matter what you do to make sure that you at least have a, uh, a proper mobile security app. Now let's say that you want to do something additional, like you want to do banking with your application, or you have a lot of personal identifiable information in there, that you might consider certain um, controls from the L2 layer, which is basically defense in depth, because, um, yeah, well, there might be things, as you'll see later in a few examples, that are very different. And then, of course, there is reverse engineering, which is basically a set of controls um, the, that you could add again to counter reverse engineering. So let's say you have uh, created a game, a Flappy Bird or whatever, um, and you want to make sure that there will be no exact Flappy Bird clone, which was obviously there because everybody cloned the app um, and made sure they could use it and then just make money with it. Uh, if you want to make sure that your IP doesn't get copied that easily, you could do a bunch of things to slow down reverse engineering. And we'll talk a little bit about switch controls later. Um, so basically there's over, uh, over 60 controls in seven different areas, such as authentication, cryptography, uh, networking, uh, storage, a lot of different things. Um, let's have an example, for instance. Um, for instance, the um, uh, second category, which is about data storage and privacy requirements. So as you can see, many of the things we think are standard for any app, so um, you should use your, you should make sure that stuff is properly secured, but um, only when you are really uh, afraid of certain keys, for instance, that might leak, um, you might want to consider, for instance, requirement 2.8, where you say, okay, we shouldn't back up very sensitive parts because we are afraid of the backups being stolen and it's so sensitive, yada, yada. As you can see, these are already quite a few requirements that we're asking uh, that we think are a good idea. But it doesn't mean that when you would do something with the MASVS that you need to apply them all. Because it might be that you have good reasons to exclude a few of these requirements, but at least you can use it as a guideline. So in that sense, it's similar to the ASVS. Of course, um, these requirements are often very heavily opinionated because what is a good security measure and what isn't? Let's take, for instance, 2.5. The clipboard is deactivated on text fields that may contain sensitive data. Um, so a good example is, for instance, when you work with passwords. What would be the problem if you would enable the clipboard with a password? Anybody, just shout it. Exactly, so you could copy that password and paste it somewhere else. That might be an issue. 
Um, at the other end, if that other application is your password manager that is able to then copy paste it into your, wait a minute, so we're disabling password managers here? That's not a good idea. So when we started with the MASVS, this sounded like a perfect idea because there were a bunch of apps in there that were actually querying the clipboard to get data in and to harvest that. Well, that was sad. So we said, okay, to make sure you don't longer have issues with that, make sure there's no clipboard on passwords. But if you look a little bit further with the current development with password managers, you actually sometimes don't have an alternative because password managers for mobile apps often just don't know that the other app is asking for a password. So you have to insert and copy it yourself. So you have to start the copy action from the password manager and inject it. So that's quite different. Um, and so as you can see, um, these requirements will be shifting over time. That's why we're versioning this stuff to make sure that it becomes easy to understand what the current requirements are and why they changed. Because otherwise it becomes very hard to explain to all developers what type of protection you have to build in. Um, because if you just say it was, um, if we don't explain this properly, basically, then why take security requirements serious? So, um, uh, how can you use this then? So, um, in the early stages of development, you can basically uh, create design decisions based on this. Um, you can have a proper baseline when you're uh, in security management to make sure that you can give guidelines to developers what they have to adhere to. Uh, and then later on, when you implement it, you can then double check, is this really what we have to protect against? How did we do this again? Um, and in the end, during penetration tests, you can already tell a priori, okay, you might find this and this and that. That's okay, because we accepted the fact that we're not going to implement this because of our threat model or our inherent risk that is still left. So we don't really bother with that. So that makes it actually much easier to communicate about mobile security in general. But of course, this is still more of a compliancy uh, angle, and it would be very nicer if we could do some active stuff with that, right? So before I dive into that, let's just quickly go through where are we right now with the MASVS. So we released version 1.1, which means we got something semi-stable in terms of requirements. It hasn't changed actually for quite a while. We got a lot of translations. So Spanish and Russian have been released. French, German, Japanese are ready to release and will release them soon. We actually got Chinese in there, or one of the four Chinese variants. Um, we started with Persian. And if anybody sees the, uh, well, if you see what grinds the gears of Peter Griffin here. That's also grinding our gears. So if you feel like, hey, I can easily do the Dutch translation, um, just contact me and uh, or contact Sven or uh, uh, check us out on the, on the Slack and just contact us, make sure we can get something working there. Um, we got lab studies last uh, uh, upsec. We're really happy about that. Um, we are actually um, uh, recommended by NIST now in uh, the NIST, well, long thing over there. Basically, uh, this is a standard about how you should vet a mobile, a mobile, secure, mobile application and the security of the application. And they're using us as one of the basic cornerstones on how to do that. So that's really cool. We're really proud of that. Um, and I say especially we, because um, there's a lot of people that worked on this. Um, and so I'm just one of the many and it's a great team to work with. And this is, of course, just a list that only worked at the requirements end, so not necessarily on the testing part, because we'll dive into that a little bit later. Um, so what we're still working with is, for instance, is getting this integrated into the security knowledge framework from um, uh, the Tenkata brothers, basically, the, another OWASP uh, flagship project, because it would be really nice if you could map all these questions to a knowledge base or the requirements to all the parts in the MCG and automate this. Um, we're working on making it simpler to release because there are more languages coming in. Um, and if you feel like I got another language like that's really important, uh, come to me and we can start adding that basically. That would be really nice. But that does mean that we have to scale up to handle all this stuff well. Um, we actually started to have conversations with the Cloud Security Alliance to see if we can do something else in terms of formalizing this, which is really nice for uh, the compliance world to um, we are revisiting location and connectivity requirements, uh, as in the sense, as in, let's say you have an application that uses Bluetooth or uses other things, are using this securely. Uh, if you're doing something purely location-based, are you taking care of the locations, data of the user well enough, stuff like that? But it's ongoing. We're reevaluating a uh, 
double cutting sword, the payload encryption. Um, why is payload encryption something relatively important? That is, for instance, because in uh, certain parts, uh, certain financial sectors in ov over the world, I thought it was somewhere in Asia, for instance, it's a mandatory thing to have that, to have payload encryption. But at the other end, the moment that they have payload encryption, uh, teams will say, it doesn't matter that you can inject stuff into our server because we have payload encryption. Wait, what? No, your server is still open. Yeah, but it's payload encrypted. The keys are right over there. Yeah, but it's payload encrypted. So to make sure that you don't get such odd debates, we didn't put those stuff in yet. But eventually you might still have to support it and, under and explain to people how you should use it, how you shouldn't use it. So we started with simple concepts right now, at least stuff that we believe with an OWASP that is simple, and we hope to extend it over time. Um, again, translations. So, of course, now it's up to you guys. Um, here you can find locations where you can find a mobile application security verification standard. I would say download it, read it, use it, give us feedback. Whether it's on the compliancy tone of things or on I'm a developer and sorry, I can't read this or whatever you have in there, let us know because we're continuously looking for improvement. Um, and make it known because everybody knows how to copy paste stuff from the MCG by now or a lot of people do that by now. Um, but this part is lesser known, which makes us all about doing something, but not a structured approach of why we're doing that something. So the more attention we can give this, I think we can help a lot of people with that. Um, so the more important part, or nah, more interesting part probably, is the mobile security testing guide. So um, it's basically a manual for the mobile application security verification standard. Um, how do you do stuff? How do you implement it? And the nice thing is you can use this for a baseline for automated checks, which is already happening. Who of you have the, seen the BDD security uh, talks from David the Siolin, I suppose, or Siokin? Nice, at least one. He did a very awesome job by taking stuff from the MASVS, look at how you should check for this in the MSCG and automate this. Um, so you need somebody to query it up. And then we have people like him that will automate this, which will speed stuff up even more, which is really awesome. Um, so the guide basically consists of a lot of stuff. So the first thing is a general testing guide, which basically describes stuff that is uh, generic to everything. I mean, AES still does the same thing cryptography-wise in iOS as in Android, right? So to explain how stuff works, we have that. And then specifically implementation-wise, we have our Android guide and our iOS guide. But that's all wording and code and instructions for tools and stuff like that. Uh, we can do way more fun stuff, for instance. We've got a bunch of crack meets and challenges, which will help you to train your reverse engineering skills and to see how some of these controls can be combined and how you can counter them. So at least you can also has become a better mobile pen tester and at the other end become a better mobile developer, learn from the mistakes in those crack meets. Um, well, we already talked about the checklist. Um, another project is the mobile security testing ground playground, which is currently an external project. It's an Android app with a lot of lessons, as you can see. And as you look, if you look at the button, uh, their names basically, uh, these uh, names will uh, link mostly directly to MSTG testing cases. So it's easy when you wrote, when you read the stuff over there, you can then start, try to exploit it at least on Android. Um, and we just released version 1.10 today. Thank you. And why is this cool? Why is this cool? Because this is the first version that for every requirement in the MASVS, and it's like 60 something, um, we have a test case and a best practices next to it. So now you can find everything. It will no longer be that will be that compliancy guy shouting, thou shalt do something I don't know. No, we can actually help you to do everything in there. Well, as I said, lab projects were mentioned in this, and we got over 3,000 stars in GitHub. Um, we're growing slowly. It's very nice. Um, we've started to do a lot of automation in there, so the correct me's are maintained easier now. Document generation is automated, so I just had to do a tag and then tweet about the fact that I released it, so that's really cool. Um, that sounds a bit weird for a document, but there's all sorts of document formats that you have to publish because people apparently want to read it on their e-reader instead of a PDF whatever. So let's help all these people together. Um, there's a lot of people that work on this. It's over 90 people actually that have done something for the MCG. 
And it's only for the current version. Before this, there was an alpha version in Google Docs where another team of people have been working on. So really, this project feels like standing on the shoulders of, of giants. I'm very proud of the team. So for instance, um, we've been hiring technical editors over time because many people started adding small chunks. But with people like Jeroen Beckers, who's sitting over there, um, give it up for him because you really give a lot of help. We could actually improve the wording of a document. Okay, that sounds a bit weird, but this is a, after all, the main product is a document. And the more clear, clarified you can be in your wording, the easier it is for a developer and a pen tester to just do it. Because if I would say a couple of very weird sentences to you about uh, how to uh, sit on a chair, you'll probably stay standing because you're like, wait, what you're asking? Um, so wording becomes very important. So if people like your own and many others, we were able to actually get somewhere. And that's very nice. And not just him, Bernard Murveller, Sven Slayer, Milan, Milan Singh Takur, I hope I'm saying it well when he looks at the recording. All these people have done a tremendous job to actually get us somewhere. And I'm still forgetting over, over 90 names, basically. So that's really cool. That makes this project really awesome. Still, there's a lot to do, and I'll probably ask you a bunch of times during the next 25 minutes whether you want to become part of the Nose 90 people. But for now, this is really nice. Um, so we were doing stuff in Java and Objective-C. Well, that's not the language we use anymore, so let's start adding Swift and Kotlin. Um, we did a lot of stuff already for Android Oreo, but with Android Pi, a lot of stuff came out again. And you can't just copy-paste from the developer uh, instructions. You do have to test it to see what it actually works. Look at other security researchers, their work, to see if countermeasures are already in place to nullify the new security controls again. So uh, for the next version to actually you know, get the new info in from last year, that always takes a little while. So even though you always might feel like, yeah, but the MCG is behind like half a year, it has a reason because we actually have to not copy paste something just from a vendor, but we have to look into stuff or at least other people have to look into stuff and then we try to reuse that or do the looking up ourselves. It's being translated in Japanese and Russian. Um, we're trying to get hard copies because we're getting more and more at, uh, requests for actually having a book so you don't have a, a, a screen in front of you, which you just can take a book and read it. Um, so that's basically what we're working on. Uh, in the future, we want to make way more crack meets uh, to show good and bad examples and to help you guys train mobile security pen testing just to get data out. Uh, we're trying to restructure the mobile security testing guide with the MASVS so that it becomes much clearer what belongs where, because it's a bit chaotic now. We might do something in mobile device management over time because those APIs get more important nowadays. Um, and there's a lot of MDM stuff that might not be worth it. And there's a lot of MDM stuff that might be worth in terms of security and actually taking care of your security. So it would be nice to show what works and what doesn't in terms of techniques, not, not um, acing vendors, but just to show which techniques are available at the platform and how you can use them. Um, and of course, we have a few things that we're dreaming of, but not sure if that's a good idea to see if we could contact Apple or Google to see, okay, um, can you help us uh, further um, uh, checking what else we missed, things that are important, but that somehow we missed in our things. Can you help us reviewing, for instance? Uh, which might make us less independent, of course. So that's why we've never done this yet. Um, and of course, keep up collaborating with standardization bodies to see if we can actually speed this up in terms of an ecosystem. And it's a lot of, well, people, political process stuff, less technical. So um, I won't bother you with that anymore. So again, for you guys, download it, read it, use it, give feedback. And we have about 59 issues left on GitHub of stuff that might need some inf investigation, stuff that might need a better write-up or whatever, and we really would like to ask you, come and help us. Show us your skills, show us your knowledge, share it with the rest of the world so it becomes easy to plug into. Um, or show your new awesome tool that we don't know about yet and show in write-ups how you could use that properly to um, vet a mobile application. So let's do some examples. So obviously it would be very nice to touch Android and iOS. I get that because Android is easy, having an emulator, etc. But yesterday there was a very nice training and I don't want to repeat stuff that was there yesterday. 
Um, if you still want to see some Android stuff, stay hanging around and maybe during Q&A ask it and we could do some live demos on Android tooling um, if we have time left. But let's for now just do some iOS stuff. All right? Let's go. So SSL pinning. Who of you doesn't know what SSL pinning or TLS uh, pinning means? A few hands. All right. So there is this um, issue in the world of who of you knows about the case of the Ginotar? Okay, there's some overlap for those who don't don't have overlap. So we um, had some very awesome stuff in our past, for instance, like CAs uh, leaking their key material so that people could hand out certificates as if they were signed by that CA. So all of a sudden, this connection could no longer be trusted. Why? Let's do a few steps back. So you see over here a, um, a mobile device that tries to connect to a server. And while doing that, you have a handshake. We're not going to get into all the details. But the basic idea is doing that handshake is that you get offered uh, a leaf certificate that might be signed by something of which the public key is then set into an intermediate or indirectly in the root CA. And because the eventual root CA is in the trust store of the uh, mobile device, you can basically verify the fact that the leave certificate has been verified and therefore you're probably talking to the right server at the right domain, just to keep it short. And you can pin to a bunch of things in there. You can, for instance, offer, so there's a bunch of things in the certificate, um, which we won't discuss in detail, but you can watch a bunch of other YouTube movies within OVAS presentations about that. But the basic idea is, is that either the trust store gets compromised, so there's rogue CAs or rogue certificates installed over there, that will uh, make your mobile device think that it can trust the leave certificate of an attacker, or a root CA gets compromised like the Gnotar, so everybody can start signing, no, everybody, the attacker who has control over the private key of such a thing like the Gnotar could then start giving out certificates for other domains which will be trusted because the Gnotar certificate will be in the trust store. So if you want to make sure that that's not an issue for you, you could do pinning. And pinning means you either pin to the certificate or the public key offered at the certificate that you know a priori. A priori, yeah, because normally if you are in control of developing the application and you're also in control of the TLS terminating endpoint, which offers a certificate to your mobile device, then you are actually knowing, okay, this is going to be the public key that we're using, this is going to be the certificate. So then you can instruct the mobile application only accept the following key or only accept the following uh, certificate. And that's really nice, um, because that it doesn't matter whether there's going to be another Digenoter type of hack, because we know which key which we're going to trust, and we're not going to connect to anything else but that key. There are also a few issues with this, and again, other talk. Um, but the most annoying part during your pen test is, if, certific if either certificate pinning or public key pinning is on, is that you can't get in between. Because if you try to proxy stuff through Burp or Zap, and you then offer the Burp or Zap certificate, you even install it on the mobile uh, mobile device, that won't help. Because no matter where you put it, that's not the stuff that's been hard coded into the app. So that's not going to help you. So you need to break that. And and below you can see the find the links, and the presentation will be online. So you can click the links and go there directly. There are certain ways to basically um, deal with those pinners. So for Android, just read it up or watch the other movies that you can find on YouTube by now. For Android, for iOS, there's basically two... Ooh, sorry. <laughs> All right, let's see if there's anything else in there. Sorry about that. So in iOS, there's two different ways to do this. The first one is jailbreak your device. Use Cydia and then uh, install SSL kill switch, enable it, and then you'll be hooked. Or do dynamic instrumentation uh, on a non-jailbroken device using Frida. Let's just quickly go through both of them, all right? So um, I don't really think, uh, because I was preparing the demos, and I saw when I did this before that the demo... Uh, uh, Lords kind of uh, didn't like me, so that's why we'll be using videos. Sorry about that. So let's see. So over here you can uh, see Burp, and on the right hand side you see a um, imitation or a sample version of, let's call it Snapchat. So the moment when we run this, if you will basically first try to log in, 
Then over, oh, sorry, something. Sorry about this. Let's see if we can make that work again. Let's try this again. Yeah, so over here, when you would try to connect with uh, pinning enabled, you will basically see that uh, it try says, check your internet connection, try again, and it doesn't work. So on this jailbroken device, I enable my SSL kill switch, and from the settings, basically, because it has a settings pane, now I try to do it again. So I open Snapchat, and you can see actually more traffic coming in already, and now if I try to log in, and obviously this is a modified mock-up, um, then over here, right now, you see in, uh, sorry, you see in, you see over here actually the, um, the, the request to response passing by. So you know you actually got through, or at least through the pinning. So what actually happens underneath is the following. Um, mobile Substrate offers a function called MS Hook function in which you can modify um, uh, responses that are used in the Objective-C runtime to give returns to uh, instruction calls. And SSL Kill Switch uses that to basically override a few things. So in iOS 9, they're, use, they're overriding the implementation of SSL Handshake, SSL Set Session Option, SSL Create Context, and iOS 10 and 11, that's TLS Helper Create Peer Trust. Those are the specific underlying calls that have to be overridden uh, in terms of the SSL handshake. What it basically does to boil it down is whenever there's a handshake and a trust verification is done, the hooks will make sure, oh, okay, doesn't matter what's in there, it always say, oh, okay, so pass through, pass through, pass through. But as you can see, it's not for one app, it's for all the apps that use this implementation. So all of a sudden, a lot of other stuff can be dissected as well. So um, that's a bit aggressive. Um, and there's a few other issues with this as well. For instance, if you have a jailbroken device, it requires maintenance. You can't just upgrade it, uh, because if you do, you lose a jailbreak. And no worry as a pen tester, because we already worked with several pen testers together, and you probably won't be the first when you do this the first time that you had to hand over a jailbroken device non-jailbroken because you pushed the update button and you thought that was a good idea. Um, that has happened multiple times. Um, and it's getting harder to find for multiple reasons. IOS, Apple is doing a good job in securing stuff, but the money you can make by actually selling the exploit used to jailbreak is a lot. So why bother having a few hours of Twitter fame or getting a lot of money? So that makes it harder to actually get new ones. And what about jailbreak protection of the app? So if you can't decompile the application because you don't have all the tools in there, um, and the jailbreak detection is still in there, then your jailbreak might get detected and you still can't use it. So the answer to all of that stuff is basically patch the app itself. So who of you was at the training yesterday? So you all have been playing with Freedal, right? Anyone there to explain Freedal a little bit? Just to share? Yeah, go ahead. Exactly. Just for the recording to repeat it, basically Frida injects an entire JavaScript runtime in there, which you can then use uh, to hook me functions to the memory to do a lot of different things. So Frida, you still have the script stuff. On the left-hand side, you can see Objection. Objection is basically Frida for lazy people, because it's really nice, because you don't have to script a lot of things, you just get it by F, putting a few commands in the REPL. Um, so let's, um, let's see how that boils down. So over here, we're having the same application, now without a jailbreak. Um, and now we're uh, deploying a snapshot payload, basically, with iOS deployed to our iOS device. So when that's, uh, and of course, you can get some errors and stuff, but it is not really important. So basically, when it's deployed, so a bunch of things happen on the background. Then uh, after that, you basically run the application, and the replication always has to run on top, equal as with uh, Frida. So the Objection Explorer, that will open the, ob the Objection, uh, the, the REPL. And as you can see, this is a fairly recent, now you can actually use recent iOS versions because you no longer have the jailbreak. So if you now try to connect, we just have the runtime open, right? Nothing else. Uh, it still will not work. But if we now um, 
go back to the REPL and we say iOS SSL pinning disable. Note the autocomplete, by the way, to make it even easier for you guys. Um, we just got through. So now we can log in and you can see the data over there. So actually now it's working. So that's pretty nice. That makes your life a lot easier. Um, so for terms of time, um, let's continue. So how does this work? Well, like we already discussed earlier, I would say zap ahead a little bit. Um, another example, something completely different. Who of you has an iPhone? Can I see some iPhones or hands? Both are fine. Um, who of you is using Touch ID or Face ID? Who of you says, I don't trust this stuff? A few, okay, that's nice. So yeah, you have actually a reason not to trust the stuff, but that's mostly from an application developer perspective. Yeah, why? Because um, there's actually two ways to use Touch ID. One is a very nice one where the Touch ID is used to actually lock up a uh, entry in, in the keychain. And with either Touch ID, depending on the configuration, uh, you could uh, unlock it or use your passcode to unlock the entry. The other one is the local authentication context. And here you can see some sort of code snippet that represents what happens there. So what it basically does is it says, um, uh, evaluate policy, uh, device owner authentication with biometrics, so face or fingers, give a reason, so that's a reason string offered, and then success or evaluation error, and if success, do success models else something else. Wait, what? So, um, uh, I think, what if we could basically um, override this and call it directly? Or do whatever we want to do over here? That's actually a nice idea. Did you know we can do that? That's cool. We can actually do that with a bunch of things. So there's a bunch of, actually everything boils down to the same thing. We actually want to use Frida to hook up to that, but now we can either use needle or objection as being laser people to, with as little effort as possible, get through the ALA context part. By the way, you can read this two ways, this presentation. One is, um, these tools are nice. The other one is, never use the, this policy ever again when you develop a mobile application. I think the latter is more important, actually. Um, so for now, this is the needle example. As you can see, the needle agent is running already. This is a jailbroken device. So we um, have to set up the, the CI crypt touch ID hook over there. Now we can run it as a script. Then when we continue, uh, it basically sets up a connection with the device. And the moment the client got connected to the uh, server over there, we try to log in. Um, And when we press login, it will try to iterate a while, and we just authenticate it with Touch ID. Wait, what? There was no dialogue. There was no Touch ID. It was not necessary. If you're not believing me, we can show the old movie on the previous slide that I didn't play for time's sake. But basically, we just overrid it. Um, we can do basically the same thing with uh, with objection, but in uh, terms of time, we're going to skip that for now because I'm already a bit uh, behind. But there's much more, actually. So we can also do um, anti-reverse engineering, like I told already, um, jailbreak detection, anti-debugging, uh, detecting reverse engineering tools to stop functioning or do some other behavior, emulator detection, uh, a lot of things that are in there. One thing you should always know is there's a reason why you put this all, for instance, also in the MASVS as a separate R requirement, because it's a slowdown mechanism. There's nothing you can put in front of somebody that somebody can't get through. Why? Because... In the end, it boils down to run still the same stuff on the same device. The device isn't modified, you just modified the app, but the actual output is still the same. Otherwise, the op and the machine can't function. So in the end, you're slowing down the attacker, which might be a good idea, so the attacker might go for the next app that's easier to break. Um, but this is just a slowdown mechanism. And then, of course, there's analysis and best practices for a lot of other things. And what it basically boils down to is making stuff simple. If you just read this up, you'll see there's nothing complex about mobile security. It's just re read well, reason well, do stuff proper. There is no magic, especially not for developers, only for pen testers to get a jailbroken device for certain tooling because it's hard. Um, <laughs> but for the rest, there's nothing interesting in there. Um, and I would like to end this presentation with just a question to you guys. Can you please help us out? Can you be, would, would you mind becoming part of our great community? to actually move this further because 
um, similar to, um, well, we had the same with the ASVS. We had the same with many other projects. The moment the community grew, basically, we were able to do a better job, serve people, spread the news easier, and at some point in time, um, actually be a less of a necessity to developers. And that will be brilliant. Thank you. Questions? Any questions? Do you work together with the OWASP Mobile Top 10? Sorry, can you repeat that, please? OWASP Mobile Top 10 projects, do you work together with them? We don't necessarily work together with them. We just um, do refer to their Top 10 to make it easier to understand how this relates. Last question, I suppose. Anyone? Last call? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.